one of you for the third memorial lecture series to commemorate the life of a legend, Father Ambrose Pinto SJ, as we remember his legacy and contributions to humanity and to celebrate a heroic life. This lecture should also prompt in us a time for self-reflection and ask how well we have applied his lessons in our own life. Father Ambrose's life reminds us that it has always seemed impossible until it is done. He taught us through his life that we can choose a world defined not by our differences, but by our common hopes. We can choose a world defined not by conflict, but by peace and justice and opportunity. Father Ambrose Pinto called a spade a spade and was a brave man. It was this quality that enabled him to actually take real pressing issues head on, a beacon to many underprivileged and toiling masses. We now have a tribute video in memory of one of the rarest gems in today's world. Hope you enjoy watching it. Thank you. On January 3rd, 2018, Reverend Dr. Father Ambrose Pinto SJ passed away. He was the principal of the college, a social activist, a professor of political science, and a faithful Jesuit. This evening, we remember his love, passion for the poor, the Dalits, and the downtrodden. Father Ambrose's contribution to writing, to social advocacy, and his passion for educational reforms needs great appreciation. Father Ambrose touched many lives and inspired thousands of students and others. May I request you to kindly stand for a moment of silence as a mark of respect for Father Ambrose on YouTube. Your presence here is a great tribute to this great Jesuit. We are honored to have with us as our speaker, Dr. Kancha Alaya Shepherd, a very good friend of Father Ambrose. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting to speak this evening with us. On behalf of our rector, our principal, I extend to you, sir, a very, very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. A warm welcome as well to all the participants here on Zoom and on YouTube and others joining us. A warm welcome to this special lecture. Thank you, Kiran, sir, for the words of welcome. If your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, become more, and what you do has a far greater impact than what you say, you truly are an inspiration. We have the most inspirational speaker for today, Dr. Kancha Ailaya Shepherd, to bring to us this lecture to commemorate the life of a man who has been a true inspiration to the world. I call upon Dr. Padma, PG Coordinator, Department of Commerce, to introduce our esteemed speaker for this evening. Thank you, ma'am. 
I indeed consider it a great privilege and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for the day, Dr. Kancha Ailea Shepard. Dr. Kancha Ailea is a renowned Indian political theorist, writer, and activist. His main domain of study and activism is the annihilation of caste, and his efforts in this domain is highly praiseworthy. Born in the village of Padayape, Dr. Kancha Alaya credits his mother, Kancha Katama, as pivotal in shaping his political thoughts. Dr. Alaya has an MA degree in political science. He was awarded his MPhil degree for his study of land reforms in undivided Andhra Pradesh. His PhD was for his work exploring the political dimensions of Buddhism. In May 2016, Dr. Kancha Ailea appended shepherd to his name, which he meant to demonstrate a symbolic break with the cultural norms. He characterizes his name change as a tool to break these norms and to value the work of what he terms productive classes. He's been a recipient of the prestigious Mahatma Jyoti Rao Phule Award and was a Nehru Fellow between 1994 to 1997. He's currently the director of the Center for Study for Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy at Maulana Azad National Urdu University in Hyderabad. He's a member of the National Research Committee constituted by the Ministry of Social Justice, New Delhi. He's also a member of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi. He has held many coveted positions like a member of the Planning Commission Subcommittee for the 11th Five-Year Plan, member of the UGC Constitutional Committee to oversee the implementation of OBC reservations in all central and state universities in India, to name a few. He has written and published numerous articles in both English and Telugu. On behalf of St. Joseph's Fraternity, I once again welcome you, sir, to the third Dr. Ambrose Pinto SJ Memorial Lecture. I kindly request you, sir, to deliver the Memorial Lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lata, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, I have uh, already retired from uh, the directorship of Maulana Azad University as well. So now I am a full-time writer. Now, it is a great privilege and an occasion to bring back my great friend's memories uh, where we have worked together on many issues. Perhaps, if I may say so, of the Jesuit, uh, you know, a community of India, I have not known a very serious human rights activist lifetime, more than uh, Dr. Amrose Pinto, anybody else. His life has been not only an inspiration to students of several institutes that he headed, including St. Joseph and Xavier College in Bangalore, and then ISI, Delhi. And then the kind of writing he did and the kind of activism he did around protecting human rights was a, a start bearer to the underprivileged struggles and uh, the protection of human rights of the most oppressed communities, be it Adivasis, be it Dalits, be it backward classes, and in a general sense, all NGO networks that were operating in India at the human rights plane and also uh, their day-to-day -day work in the rural areas. Whenever there was a problem, uh, Amrose was in the forefront of demonstrations all over the country, Delhi, Bangalore, wherever 
the activism and movements were taking place. You know, I remember some of the major key contributions that Amrose did from the higher educational institutions, particularly run by the Catholic uh, institutions, which have highest respect and demand in this country. But for a long time, the English medium education that the Catholic institutions established and conducted spread about for a long time were confined to uh, you know the Dvijas, the Brahmins, Banyas in North India, Kayasthas, Katris, some of Kshatriyas, but not many Dalits, OVCs, uh, Shudras, uh, and also Adivasis got benefited. And the college that he headed was the most prestigious college in Bangalore. So we used to discuss several times. Amrose, you know, how to really shift the focus of Catholic best institutions which have educated. You know, the most cunning Brahminical forces from St. Stephen's to, you know, Bangalore institutions to Xavier of Bombay or Loyola's and so on. So how can we shift this to the Dalits, the Adivasis. After he returned from Delhi, ISI, and again took over the evening college of uh, St. Joseph, Bangalore. And he did a remarkable thing. He said, Kancha, a year afterwards, I'm not going to admit Brahmins in my college. The admission principle will change. So what he did in the next very next year, he advertised in such a manner that most of the uh, slum dwellers, mostly Dalits and lower sections of OBCs and some of the tribals, uh, even Muslims who were living in slums and Christians who got converted from Dalit background and so on. So the first time, not a single Brahmin appeared in the selection list of St. Joseph Evening College. And it was a very prestigious college and most of the seats went to Canada uh, educated in the PUC course and then in BA course and so on. And, you know, St. Joseph is a very highly modernist English medium college, but he took number of regional college educated, regional school educated kids, boys and girls, some of the Northeastern kids and so on. I used to go very regularly there. So there was a hue and cry in Bangalore. How come that you did not admit one caste? And he said, uh, yeah, that is our new norm, new principle. Whom to admit, whom not to admit. We make the guidelines, we implement. Finally, the issue went to the chief minister. At that time, I think it was uh, uh, that Krishna, SR Krishna, he called him. And he asked him, uh, Dr. Ambrose Pinto, you know, this is very unfair to show bias towards a particular caste in admissions like this. And Amros told me what reply he gave later. He said, sir, 
when we have not admitted a single Dalit, Adivasi, poorest of the poor, no chief minister asked me. I did admit such kind of uh, students earlier. I was in the day college. And when they were not admitted, nobody asked me, no minister, no chief minister, no, even a counselor asked me. Now I have changed my principle of admission. Now you are asking me, that means the powerful can influence the chief minister office, but not the poor. Sir, I have changed the guidelines to empower the poor. And believe me, within three years, starting with PUC course, four years, he admitted his own PUC people into BA and BSc commerce. And within five years, most of these kids were in the best jobs and their English skills were excellent all over. And uh, Amroz told me, Kancha, you have been fighting all your life for English medium education, for poorest of the poor, and I will do this till my last breath. And he did that. And this is the man who left us, maybe fortunately left before the corona kind of, kind of pandemic came and devastated the world and the rest of the poor before our eyes. We don't know how we will recover from this. We don't know how the poor will su survive in this world, in this country particularly. The world is very concerned about Indian poverty, the labor who lost all kinds of jobs and walked hundreds and thousands of miles and died on the way. So it is on this occasion, I am very glad that uh, I was asked to give this memorial lecture in honor of a great soul who did immense work for the uplift of poor and protection of human rights. Now what I thought as a topic for today is the status of human rights in India and in the world in the context of pandemic, corona, and also otherwise the right-wing regimes, particularly in India, what is the status of human rights when the BJP RSS are ruling? I'll try to quickly wrap up and then we'll have a discussion The status of human rights has come to a situation where even Ambrose would not have imagined in his lifetime after a great uh, 75 years of struggle in the freedom movement and then America's constitution and democracy and worldwide the forms of democracies, particularly the Christian world as thrown up, uh, would come to this level. And then a new phase of history would begin what is now known as post-COVID world. Now, in the COVID world, Human rights conditions have turned almost 180 degrees where neither the constitutions nor the judicial institutions nor the street fights or the activism of human rights would 
play any helping role uh, in this situation. Countries after countries suddenly went into authoritarian mode uh, in a situation where uh, last six, seven years, Amroz himself was a witness to the rise of right-wing uh, governments and manipulation of elections all over the world. Now, when the pandemic struck China, we did not realize what was happening there because the Chinese uh, human rights openness is uh, very suspectable, and therefore, we didn't know what exactly happened there. But later on, once the pandemic spread to a world of uh, democratic institutions, uh, and particularly when it came to India, with one stroke of declaration on 24th night, the Prime Minister of India has closed the whole country for a month, just giving four hours night time. Now, that was something unexpected at that time. The COVID has not really spread. It has not killed many people in the country. There were hardly 500 cases reported. But the lockdown has destroyed millions of lives in the urban areas. And uh, the estimate was uh, 400 million people suddenly became jobless, workless, foodless, shelterless, and they started walking back to their villages. And we have seen the death row, we have seen the starvation, we have seen the chains of human conditions. Now, if this was what it happened to India, we have seen in United States of America, the white supremacism started attacking blacks. Whenever there was a possibility. So massive police attacks on black individuals started. Luckily, unlike in India, the Black Lives Matter movement, they did not care the COVID. They did not care the lives of the living people and hundreds and thousands came into streets. And that spread like a wildfire. And it became an anti-slavery movement as well. And uh, statues began to be pulled down. And in America, the white supremacism has taken a different shape. Even the president of America, Donald Trump, started openly supporting supremacism. So the right-wing politics, but in India, the worst part of it is even that kind of protest would not be possible. Millions of jobless, millions of labor, millions of people who went to villages where they were not allowed to come in because of the pandemic fear. Courts were not interfering. Nobody was coming out, lawyers, doctors' life was miserable. Hospitals were completely shaken off. So in this situation, even protests were not psychologically possible in a country of 
1300 uh, million people whereas 300 350 million people american the blacks came out and fought uh, straight away directly the police and so on now it is in this situation judiciary got paralyzed and even when they started working we would not have imagined this earlier the judiciary completely took a pro-state stand it was not operating a third organ of the state where it has an independent role to play and ask the states to uh, work out means and uh, livelihood operations. Grains were in the go-downs, money was in the banks, and people should have been given immediate livelihood. Whereas countries like Western democracies were giving massive uh, financial inputs into human lives that were losing jobs. Eight months, one year, you know, uh, without job survival was being in a way taken care though, which is scary in England, in Italy, Spain. France and Germany were luckily not so heavily affected. But even in America, bailouts were happening in a big way. But India was, that was not possible. State was not coming forward. And whatever the 20 lakh crore they declared, it was not actually uh, the money that was meant for the poorest of the poor. So finally, they said one lakh crore, but they ultimately seem to have distributed about 75,000 crores or so. Now, it is this kind of a shocking. And in this process, all NGOs got shut. Earlier, the right-wing government here, FCRIs were closed are monitored very severely. And then new rules were brought out. NGOs were set down. Small employees, thousands of employees who were working around NGOs. They thought that NGOs means only Christian NGOs. But no, in fact, NGOs are uh, more non-Christian. Very few are Christian NGOs. Of late, the Dalits, the tribals have got in uh, small jobs in NGO sector, all those jobs have gone. Schools, colleges have been closed, creating psychological atmosphere at home and outside, a fear psychosis. And then came this, the internet methods of teaching and so on. But this uh, proved that millions and millions of children and parents did not have a phone to access uh, lessons to their children. And millions of children were living on midday meal in the school. Their protein food was coming from there. All those were shut and nothing was being delivered to their parents to cook, except few governments like Andhra Pradesh government under Mr. Jagan Mohan Reddy and Kerala government seem to have done much, much better providing the avenues of food resource and uh, health care and so on. Health care gone disarray and the poor have suffered a lot. Now it is in this situation 
small NGOs, Christian organizations, and others. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the Muslim world also did not have democratic structures. We don't know what happened there. Millions of people lost jobs in Gulf. Uh, the Hindutva right wing attack on Muslim after the Delhi Muslim conference and they spread all over and then uh, they were seen as the spreading agents of uh, coronavirus. So all kinds of abusive social media networks started working. And this led to a reaction in the uh, Gulf countries. They removed hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs. Uh, one Kerala itself is said to have lost about six lakh jobs in Gulf countries. As a reaction to the Hindutva right wing, and there the Muslim right wing and emotionally communal people, companies, individuals who employed people as household workers and so on, threw them out. So it was this kind of a horrendous situation. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the Indian Christian world, I would say the Catholic high-end educational institutions should have produced, apart from at least a few Dalit, OBC, Shudra, intellectuals from their fold, because unless there is a good English, there cannot be any intellectuality in this country. Regional languages cannot produce intellectuals. But the Christian networks did not even produce many intellectuals like Ambrose Pinto, who got out of their shells of teaching and uh, service, doing service. And we have not recorded with laborious scientific methods of studies how in 1897 plague, in 1818 plague, how Indian illiterate masses saved themselves. In 1897 plague, where my grandfather died, my grandmother from Warangal town took all her sheep with her widowed sister into forest zones and started rebuilding, uh, disease distancing, uh, human isolation, uh, and then building up economy from forest to plains. So millions of people. Mahatma Jyoti Rao Pule died in 1990 and his wife Savitri Bai Pule and their adopted son, who was the first English medium missionary educated man, who he was a Brahmin widow child and Pule and Savitri, ba Savitri Bai Pule and Pule adopted him. He became the first officially trained doctor. They started a plague treating clinic in Pune slums. And in 1897, while treating, while helping the patients and children, because plague was a very, very dirty disease, it, people will want out, people will uh, have motions and so on. So Savitri Bhai died of plague in 
Her son, the first Shudra doctor, also died of the same plague. In those days, Brahmins and Banyas, whom Pule called Shedjis and Bodjis, were not becoming doctors because they were supposed to touch everybody who comes to have a treatment. So they were not becoming doctors. Yashwant Rao was the first doctor. So in that plague, one crore Indians died. At that time, Indian population, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, was roughly around 20 crore. Now we are 135 crores. So we don't have to be afraid as much as they were afraid. And they ran away into forests and the shepherds uh, with all their courage, rebuilt villages, hundreds of villages which shepherds spread out and then rebuilt uh, villages, shepherds, fishermen, and Banjara tribes. So they built houses from distance, each from each other and then built. So those methods were there. We did not study properly. We did not give enough courage and there were indigenous herd immunity mechanisms. Nobody studied. Of course, the Brahmin intellectuals who studied in St. Stephen's, Loyola's, even St. Joseph's, they went abroad, came back, and treated all of us as untouchables or illiterate, ignorant, and they did not want to talk about caste. But I didn't understand what happened to Christians who were around these schools and colleges as intellectuals. The Jesuits dedicated their life to educate the Apaka, Dvija Apaka children in English to make them American vice presidents, British finance minister. British home, home Minister. So they're all in those countries treating all these Dalits, Adivasis, and all of them tribals, OBCs, Shudras, even the Jats, Gujas, Patels, Lingayat, Voklinga, and Kamma Reddy, all of them are in the regional languages. So all the sacrifice, the nuns, the Jesuits, without getting married, dedicating to Jesus, dedicating to his service, his liberation, educated these people in English, and they became intellectuals to keep India what it is. You know, I was telling repeatedly when Joseph Ambrose was there, even in the, their college lecture, I said, if Catholic Christians, Instead of educating these people like this, by remaining nuns and Jesuits, if they were to get married and procreated more children, they would have pro produced more humanity, humanitarian Christians in this country. But they did not do that. They sacrificed. I understand. But for whom? So we have no intellectuals today to understand and the few intellectuals like Ambrose, who neck, put their neck out from their colleges, institutions, never bothered about their foreign province, never bothered about his on-time breakfast, on-time lunch, on-time dinner, so on and so forth. And this man always used to live in a very simple T-shirt and a very old, never I saw him wearing very new clothes. Not that he could not have, all his salary he left to the institutions. And he took the decision at the fag end of his life, no, I will not teach these people who don't want to realize. In their religion, they don't give the right to priesthood, to the Dalits, to the Adivasis, to the sutras, 
a linga, a work linga, or a kamma, or a reti, cannot become priest in those temples. But yet, they hang around the same institutions. And they don't want to learn modern English and don't want to become intellectuals. So there is a big burden that jo Ambrose has left on us in this new condition of deterioration. I don't know what kind of post-COVID world will emerge. We are saying in America, democracy may get shuttered. President doesn't want to vacate White House. If that happens in America, a democracy of 243 years, what will happen to India? What will happen to many other Eastern European countries? And China is rising in its own style. Christianity is growing there, but they don't want to allow now. Earlier, they were allowing. So it was in this situation, the right spiritual democracy is also getting shocked, getting shock treatments. Christian world is becoming more and more rigid. Fundamentalism is growing. We could see what France and the Muslim fundamentals were clashing for. <clears throat> so it is in this situation, I think on Jesuits, both teachers and because the best schools and colleges are still under your, your teaching and your guidance. If you produce 100 Dalit Bhaujan, 100 Shudra Dalit Bhaujan intellectuals in the next decade and produce 100 intellectuals from your own fold, who can write and rewrite the history of this country. You know, who said that Christianity or spiritual democracy started only with colonialism here? Or even with St. Uh, Thomas here? Way back when Arappa, who built the Arappan city civilization, after building the villages first, and then animal economy, and then fishing economy, and then built Harappa, Mohanjadaro, Dholavira cities. That was a parallel civilization to that of the Abrahamic civilization in Israel. Even here, people believed in one God. The Arappans believed in one God. There is enough evidence. The Abrahamic, Abrahamic people believed in one God. So there is a parallel, the way Moses, uh, you know, got liberated and then the great uh, exodus took place. And such exodus of Harappans took place from the north to south. You know, Ayappa in the far Kerala, is a descendant of Harappa who migrated to this area. So the Dravidians were the migrants in a great exodus after the Aryan invasion came in to the south and building of this South Indian civilization, which is much better than the North Indian, unequal, brutal, totally communal, anti-women, so these parallel civilizations existed, and we need to restudy this. In Christian institutions, of course, under the new education policy, they will teach only about Vedas and Rama and Mahabharata. They want that. But no, we should say, no, we will teach Harappan civilization. We will teach how Harappa was much greater a human being and how they built cities and civilizations. Then link it up to the present, to the present uh, colors, to the present man-woman relations, cultures, production. 
production is treated as pollution in this country. And this is where it was Jesus who liberated the production values of Israel when the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, 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 Jewish uh, priests were condemning production. What was the status of a shepherd before Jesus was born? The status of a shepherd was worst. Shepherd was treated as a, a ledger and a barbaric person. And therefore, be Jesus said, I am the shepherd and God is shepherd. Therefore, it is this vision that he liberated slaves, he liberated Samaritans who were Dalits, he liberated Gentiles who were treated foreigners, and illiterates, ignorant, stupid, agriculturists, and he liberated all his disciples were from the you know, Gentiles, except Paul. How did this happen? So therefore, my feeling is, time has come. If we don't neck out to rewrite Indian history and claim that, no, the, the notion of one God and the direct relationship to God by one individual is as Indian as it was of Abrahamic people in the Arapan times, pre-Vedic times. That was the civilization of 1500 years. Originally, we are Indo-Africans. Then came Indo-Aryans. Uh, uh, Indo, uh, Therefore, the blacks are writing. Isabel Wilkins, Wilkinson has written a great book on caste. Why not Indian Christians? What happened to you? How long you will shut your mouth with this best English medium schools and colleges under your grip? Whom do you teach? And why do you teach? Is it for money? Are Christians living in Indian schools and colleges who are collecting pieces and uh, living a, a, a comfortable life? No. Amrose did not live like that. If Amrose is our example, your example, you know, you, every one of you must become a disciple of Amrose. Thank you very much. Sir, you truly did justice uh, with those valuable thoughts of a legend who needs to live on, continue to live on through our work, our life, and uh, through activism. Father Ambrose was a true human right activist, the best that existed till date. He was truly an inspiration to the younger generation through his writing and activism. He was a torch bearer for the underprivileged struggle. His courage to take a stand as head of institution to open the doors of education for the underprivileged should be recognized. And surely in today's context, as you said, so where everything is so miserable, I think we need legends like Father Ambrose Pinto to come alive through our work and activism and enable everyone to live a dignified life. And so thank you also for being an inspiration uh, for walking the talk. So for, for many of us, we look up to you also through your writings uh, for being a great inspiration and fighting to restore human rights. Thank you, sir. It was indeed an honor and privilege and uh, an apt person to talk about a legend. Thank you, sir. I also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of family members of uh, Father Ambrose Pinto. Oh. Uh, Florine Pinto and others. Uh, it, it's our, we deem it our privilege that you took time off to come and be with us at this uh, memorial lecture. Thank you, everyone. Can you, can you sh show them, ask them to open up their videos? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I'll just request. Ma'am, they're on YouTube, ma'am. Uh, they're watching through YouTube live. They're on YouTube. Sir, they're on YouTube. Thank you, sir. Again, we will now have the question and answer session. I would call upon Professor Tarrell of the Maths Department to moderate the session. I request the participants to kindly post your questions in the chat box and it will be addressed. Over to you, Professor Tarrell. Thank you, 
uh yes so i have already got few questions from youtube chat box i will uh, read it out to you sir and uh, you can the 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 yeah uh, so the first question uh, is from akila karani she is asking uh, sir could you brief us on dr ambros uh, love towards students children and how was he in that aspect well uh, you know whenever i uh, went to bangalore i used to uh, stay in one of the rooms in the same hostel where he was staying you know he was an amazing person living like a student you know within students all the time and uh, he would know all the names of his students in the college as principal not just as i used to be surprised because i taught almost for 45 years uh, but i hardly used to remember one class students names but amros is not like that so secondly the way he used to train you know once when i went to give a lecture there uh, he introduced me of a dozen uh, black students who came from different african countries and a dozen of uh, northeastern tribal students and told about their merits their their capabilities before each one of them spoke i asked later when we went to dinner sometimes we used to go out dinner both of us to have a one to one talk leaving the dining hall there in the institute uh, so um, he was amazing he used to engage and interact with every student from principal office and sort out the best uh, curious and capable and then train them not that he would neglect the weak but uh, that's that's a great quality of a teacher he did that thank you so much sir uh, well that clearly shows the hallmark of a great person how he knows about everyone uh, so the next question is from miss hajira uh, her question is uh, what is your opinion on the love jihad issue right now that is happening in the country well the the issue of love cannot be attached with the jihad question you know the idea of jihad as it evolved in the quranic thought is a different kind of liberation and the sense with which they are using it in india now even all over the world after terrorism became uh, a kind of major debate after 911 and subsequently what happened in india so uh, love is love you know there are umpteen instances in my own state there is a dalit boy and a vaishya girl they got they got into liking each other and they got married and the vaishya father who was very rich and father and mother they convinced the daughter to not to go for that marriage and they harassed her they arrested her within house but she did not listen and finally they married and after one year or so the father strategized and got this boy called uh Uh, vinay uh, got hacked in the public and there is another case a reddy girl got in love with getting got into love with a vaishya boy 
the ready father who was richer than them, not that they were poor, did not want that intercaste marriage also. So the, the girl was harassed, the girl was put inside, they put cameras, but when there was a electricity power off, the girl ran away and got married outside in Samari Samaj. And later on, the whole family got involved and uh, brutally killed that boy. Now, this girl is living in a Dalit house with, a, with her in-laws. That girl is living in a Vaishya house with her in-laws. So there, there is something deep in this. Now, a Muslim girl or a Muslim boy and a non-Muslim girl or a boy can get entangled with this kind of a situation. Now, they call this love jihad. And then strategize the societal or state uh, law to abolish this. No, then it is, uh, it is going to lead us in a bad way. That's a big problem. You know, partly I think the Muslim world also has to reposition its man-woman relation. I'm very sure about it. Muslim world also does not allow women's freedom. What rest they have is a different question. But choosing their own husbands or wives within the Muslim world is also not possible. It is like our caste marriage. Within India, so much of Muslim population is there. The restricted life is not acceptable. To them. So that civilization, that uh, man-woman relationship gives a lot of scope for the Hindutva right wing to adopt them. I think a more free Muslim society world over will bring democracy there, will bring open man-woman relationship outside uh, in the house. You know, I don't believe and accept that man-woman relationship is only a sex relation. Absolute nonsense. Whoever thinks so. Therefore, Muslim society has to reform hugely. And this love jihad idea cannot be accepted in India. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, I think, I hope Ajira has got her answer. Uh, sir, the next question is, uh, sir, you have mentioned about how important bilingual education is for India. So do you think that the trilingual system that the NEP 2020 proposes in addition to the voluntary teaching of regional languages till grade five is an effective measure. This is asked by Ruchira. No, Ruchira, is a, I've been writing a lot on this and what the Andhra Pradesh government adopted is a right course. We don't need three languages. Every child from LKG to 12, should learn education in English medium with one subject in regional language or what their language is. That's enough. And that will make them equally proficient in both the languages because uh, their language is spoken in the market at home. And if one subject consistently from class one to 12 will empower them there, and English should be the common Indian language. I'm totally against three language formula and we should all fight it out. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question would be, uh, sir, could you please share your experience and contribution done in the Committee for Protection of Democratic Rights in Mumbai as you have been part of it? Well, uh, I was working with uh, OPDR for some time and then we had uh, relations with several civil rights organizations in the world, in the country. And uh, we went to Kashmir in 1992 to study their situation and so on. 
So, uh, you know, the Maharashtrian state or any state, see, I found two problems with uh, Western and the Northern India. One is their hypocrisy. The educated English speaking elite are mostly from Dvijas and they try to emphasize on vegetarianism, which is anti national. A country of uh, India's human size, where 60% of food basket constitutes meatarian foods. If it is forced to go vegetarian, India will die. And in Maharashtra, I found that is a very, very problematic. The second one, their hypocrisy on language, medium of instruction in government schools. They want English medium in private schools, they want regional languages in government schools. Why? Because the poor cannot get English. The very same people who are getting Sanskrit in private schools, Gurkulas. Then during 900 years of Muslim rule, the same Dvijas, the Brahmin, the Banya, the Kayas, the Katri, or whoever, they were also getting Persian language. So Persian language did not come to Shudras, OBCs, Dalits, Adivasis. Sanskrit did not come to them. Now English did not come to them. Now this is the problem with human rights activists there also. So I found a lot of Brahminism in human rights activism, left movements. Wherever the Brahmin or Dvijas are leading, in the name of secularism, they have hidden a whole range of their hegemony. We don't accept that. We want English medium. Our Arapan food culture back to India. You know, Arapan South, they did it. They ate every meat available there. Otherwise, food surplus would not have happened. So this Brahminic... Uh, uh, food cultural vegetarianism is anti -nation. Read my book in um, this uh, online called Anti-National Vegetarianism. You will understand. Then uh, English is Indian. Every child should learn it. Please read some of those articles. Sure, sir. Uh, so now I'll open the questions to the Zoom members. Uh, is there anybody in the Zoom meeting who would like to ask any questions? Please raise your hand and I'll unmute. You can unmute and ask the question. Anybody? Uh, since I don't see anyone raising hand or unmuting and asking, uh, I'll go on to the last question that was posted on YouTube. Uh, uh, so, the last question would be, where do you, uh, sorry, where do you see the country uh, in political status in the next 10 years? Well, uh, we will have to uh, gaze and understand. We can't build a utopia now because how does the pandemic operate? What is that the vaccines are going to do? In the next one year, we don't know. And how does the economies of the world will emerge in the post-pandemic period? One assessment is it would be worse than Second World War or 1939 depression. And in that situation, what will happen in India is a very scary thing because we need to feed uh, 135 crore people. 
a lot of uh, children and our educational institutions are inadequate, our hospitals are very bad. The only hope is that modern technology may give us more leverage to handle this than in 1930s and 40s. So I can't really predict now, but uh, the only hope is that a lot of uh, educational campaigns at the risk of uh, losing many things, for example, teaching English to rural children and youth, formal education, informal thing like the adult education programs need to be done. A lot of restructuring of private schools should take place. Because the NEP is playing a mutuous game. It is allowing privatization of education. And it is imposing restrictions of language and syllabus on Indian institutions, government institutions. Whereas private institutions run as they want. There is no uh, state can state control there. So given this, I think one cannot predict, but we have to guess something that again the poorest of the poor, the Dalit Adivasi, Shudra OBCs will really suffer. And we need to uh, work out strategies of uh, giving them education. Every girl should be 12th educated up to 12th class in English medium. Then I think the risk is less. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was a great pleasure uh, to ask the questions uh, what the few of the viewers have posted. And I think uh, it was very insightful from your end. Uh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure to ask questions. Uh, I hand over the stage to Lata, ma'am, to take over further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Taran, also um, uh, for moderating the question answer session. And sir, thank you for so patiently uh, clarifying all the doubts uh, that were there from the members who are attending this program. Thank you once again, sir. A small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. We are blessed to have our rector, Dr. Father Sweber de Silva, who has great plans for our college and to take our vision and mission forward. I like to call upon Dr. Jayati Badra, HOD Big Data Analytics to introduce our rector and invite him to bring the message. Thank you, Lata. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Reverend Father Swiber de Silva SG. Even though Father Swiber is a mathematics professor at his core, he comes with a distinguished background. He has served as principal of St. Aloysius College Autonomous Mangalore, as director of St. Joseph's College of Law, and now as the rector of St. Joseph's College Autonomous Bangalore. Reverend Father Swiber is an experienced administrator with a demonstrated history of working in the education management industry. His areas of special interest are research, management, business strategy, teaching, and higher education. As a person, Father Swibert comes across as warm, approachable, and cool in crisis. He is both a pillar of strength as well as inspiration to all staff members and enjoys widespread support for his great human qualities. We at St. Joseph's College Autonomous Bangalore are honored to have such a distinguished educationist and administrator as our rector. 
ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Father Swibert De Silva SJ for his presidential remark. Father Rector. Thank you, Dr. Jayati, for those uh, wonderful words of introduction. Uh, I must thank uh, Professor Kancha Ailaya for that wonderful, enlightening, and enriching and challenging uh, address that he delivered on the third Ambrose Bento Memorial Lecture. He challenged us in various ways, especially as education is that we must uh, produce people who have uh, capacity to think, think differently, and not just uh, learn something from the rote memory and copy it or, or reproduce it. But that is the challenge that he has given to us as educationalists. Thank you, Professor Kanchari Laya, for that wonderful talk that challenged us to look ahead in a different manner. Father Ambrose Pinto and myself started teaching together probably at St. Joseph's Boys High School and then later on moved to the college level. As far as I know, Father Ambrose Pinto, I can say that he was a soldier, he was a saint, and he was a gentleman. Ambrose was a soldier. He fought for a cause, an idea, an ideal, an ideology. The poor, the marginalized, the socially low and neglected, especially the Dalits, he fought for them. He fought at the local, national and international levels through talks, writings, conferences. He was recognized an advocate of them. Ambrose was also a saint, I must say. I'm not canonizing him, not a sad saint, nor a sorry saint, nor a goody-goody one. He prayed regularly, spent time in silence and reflection. He confided during his last days, I have uh, always felt God is with me even when times were difficult. These days he said, I want to be alone with God. Since his commitments and options were clear, it was not difficult for him to make choices to decide things. Ambrose was also a gentleman, not a perfect one. He had his limitations. Perhaps occasionally he, he was cut and dried. Too clear cut, perhaps even when reality was murky. We know reality is not black and white. It is often gray, but he could rise above petty things. His loyalty to the church and the society of Jesus were never in doubt. He maintained confidences and confidentiality. At a time when society at large is ruled by caste, language, and other petty loyalties, and even the church and society are not free from these, Ambrose stands out as a person of tall stature challenging us to rise above our narrow and subtle hidden loyalties in the interest of better human communities. Ambrose was fearless in his speech and writings. He spoke out his mind clearly. He stood up in public for justice and the right to live and the obligation to, to, to let live. He was a sharp critic of liberalization privatization and globalization and of the corporate culture. He was a good, great scholar. Articles flowed from his versatile head, responding quickly to the emerging socio-political scenario. Many books he wrote or edited or co-edited. Actually, he wrote five books and edited 10 of them and co-edited five and articles were hundreds in newspapers, journals, and many other places. Serious articles, not for entertainment or pastime. He even received a fellowship at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla. He was an associate of great scholars and eminent national personalities 
like Kuldeep Nair, Tista Settlebard, who called him when he was in the hospital, then our own now today's speaker, Kanchalaya, Mehta Patkar, Kanaya Kumar, John Dayal, many of them were of his great friends, and especially our own brutally murdered Gauri Lankesh. With these, he made common cause and often shared common platforms. As all of us know, Ambrose was an activist too. He enthused the students, the staff, and the public to stand up for justice and truth. He was a successful administrator too uh, of the college. He fostered research and academics in the Institute of Learning. When he retired as principal of St. Joseph's College, the Archbishop was quick to request him to serve the College of the Diocese, St. Aloysius College here in Bangalore. Today, his students and those influenced by him adorn important positions in civil society and state machinery, continuing his legacy. So with all these, Ambrose was a great person, and I think it's nice that we remember him every year with this lecture. I would like to thank all those who have organized this uh, lecture, the third Ambrose Pinto Memorial Lecture, especially Dr. Kiran, and all those who have participated, I would like to ask you to follow the steps of Father Ambrose and be radical, be decisive, and fight for the poor and the ordinary so that our society becomes a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father, for your message and for so beautifully describing Father Ambrose Pinto as a soldier, as a saint, as a gentleman, an activist and an administrator. And we as collaborators are proud to follow a legacy he has left for us and imbibe his values of wit, courage, and thank you, Father, you really uh, captured uh, the message so well. Uh, Learn to be thankful for what you already have while you pursue all that you want. I like to call upon Professor Arka Dev, Department of Communication, to bring to us the vote of thanks. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, we, I think I'll definitely start off with Dr. Kancha Ilaya Shepherd because for every topic, sir, that you spoke on, you introduced us to at least one new and either do non-highlighted point. And that's the case for everything you said. And each time we were forced to use more nuance to our thinking, as in we had to think from another new perspective when looking at the same problem that we thought was so familiar to us. And we are definitely grateful for it, sir. Thanks are also in order for our rector, Father Sweebert De Silva, and our principal, Father Mr. Lobo, for your help, support, and encouragement that has continued over quite some time now. Thanks also to the entire PRO team, including the public relations interns, for making newer grounds for what is fast becoming a new tradition for us the third Father Ambrose Pinto Memorial Lecture. Thanks also to Professor Lata Paul, our MC, Professor Padma, Professor Jayati, everybody who introduced anybody and everybody who helped. And finally, a huge thank you to all our participants, irrespective of platform, whether it's Zoom, whether it's YouTube, whether it's anywhere else. Because of you, we now hope to see our numbers continue to increase as this annual lecture series continues. Once again, thank you all and thank you individually. Professor Paul, back to you. Thank you, Professor Arkadev, uh, for the vote of thanks. May we all kindly rise as the national anthem will be played for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.